This is a response to a request we got, weirdly enough, after our Show Mengeki video, where we were asked to do an introduction recommendation regarding the work of Hao Xiaoxian. Thanks to the recent success of The Assassin, Taiwanese filmmaking legend Hao Xiaoxian, or Triple H if you're hardcore, is gradually becoming more popular than ever. And because he's had a career that spans out so long, it may be tricky trying to work out where you want to start with his work. The BFI released a great article recently by John Barra that informed how Shen newbies where to start with his work, and we've posted a link to that article in the video description below. As good as this is, we thought we'd take a slightly different direction. Now it's important to note that this is not a scholarly analysis or even a video essay. It's simply a personal recommendation video from a bunch of guys that have loved Ho's work for a long time. Now, to make sense of our recommendations, I need to go on a bit about a few historical aspects, and certain evolutionary shifts Ho made during his career, so apologies in advance if this video is a bit longer than many feel that it needs to be. But anyway, the first thing we need to go through is a little bit about his background. Hao Xiaoxian was an important part of what's now known as the Taiwanese New Cinema, or New Wave. This is a massive subject and really deserves a video in itself, but to understand it properly, you have to take into account Taiwanese cinema's history. I'm going to attempt to do this as briefly as possible, so bear with me. In 1901, Taiwan experienced its first taste of cinema, but due to the Japanese occupation, the films were primarily voyeuristic propaganda works, which were customised more for Japanese audiences and their exotic fantasies of Taiwan. The films often appealed to the derogatory perceptions of the Taiwanese aboriginals, champion in Japan's so-called superior culture. Then in 1937, the Sino-Japanese War caused a stoppage to films being made altogether. This went on until the mid-1940s, when the nationalists took over Taiwan, and by the end of the Chinese Civil War in 1949, Shanghai filmmakers that were sympathetic to the nationalist movement emigrated to Taiwan. By the 1950s, they developed the country's first independent film establishment. By independent, I mean their own and not Japan's. As the 60s reared its head, the government attempted to modernise by introducing health realism films. This suspect sounding genre attempted to didactically enforce traditional moral values in the form of propaganda melodramas. But don't let my pessimism sway your judgement though. There were some good films made in this health realism era, but were almost always by the talented Lee Sing, who's actually worth tracking down as well. Anyway, this fizzled out fast, and by the 1970s, more romantic dramas began to emerge, and during the back end of this decade, Taiwan's social realism films began to explode. Well, they should be considered exploitation films more than social realism, but hey, that's what they were called. What these films generally lacked in cinematic innovation, though there were some good eggs, they compensated with sex, violence, gang culture, and an overall resistance against the government's censorship standards of the time, especially regarding sex. When the social realist film's limitations began to fold on themselves, Taiwanese cinema needed something special to combat the rise of home videos, and the popular Hong Kong imports that were monopolising on the industry. At this point, a lot of Hong Kong films were merged productions with Taiwan. They shared actors, directors, even production teams. This meant there was never really a distinctive identity regarding Taiwanese cinema. It was always just a shadow of the Hong Kong productions. This is when the new wave starts to come in. In 1982 and 83, two omnibus films called In Our Time and The Sandwich Man were made by a group of young Taiwanese filmmakers and was the first sign of efforts to sidestep away from the old escapist method of filmmaking and focus on specific issues unique to Taiwan. Non-professional actors were cast, traditional narrative structures were broken, and the line between fiction and documentary was obscured. Like the other New Wave directors, Hao grew up in post-World War II era Taiwan, where the country was being forced into a transition from an agricultural identity to a more industrial capitalist culture. There was a solidarity amongst these filmmakers that drove the movement. The legend that is now Edward Yang 
would hold meetings with writers, directors and cinematographers in his house. Other key players were Wu Nianjin, who often wrote for Hao Xiaoxin and directed the second wave classic A Borrowed Life. Cinematographer Chen Kun Ho was also very significant. He directed the new wave's most notable masterpiece, Growing Up. Other big names if you're interested, and forgive my bad pronunciations, but Chang Yi, Ai Chen Ko, Ti Chen To, and the massively overlooked Wan Tong, and of course, Hao Xiaoxin. Their films depicted the various cultural and economic issues the Taiwanese people had to experience as a consequence to this modernization. The work was personal and heavily naturalistic, focusing on the everyday lives of the local people and their natural environments. They were shot on location, using local and rural dialects, fragmented narratives, a restraint from sentimentality, and long continuous takes, something I'm going to come back to a little later on. Hao Xiaoshen almost epitomized Taiwan's first new wave. From his interest in the country's social political evolution, to his ever refining methods of meditative filmmaking. Even the fact he himself was born in the Guangdong province of China, to which his family fled during the Chinese Civil War, giving him a profoundly personal insight into Taiwan's complex cultural identity. Hopefully that gives you a basic idea of the new wave and its relevance to Hao Xiaoshen. If you want a better understanding though, and one that's less rushed, you should watch Tony Rain's BFI talk on Hao Xiaoshen, which is also linked in the description. But anyway, let's get back to Triple H. I'm going to be using Hao's distant cinematic approach as a way of giving this video structure. When you get a good idea of this, all of the other aspects of his career and work kind of fall into place. It's also a good way to figure out where you would prefer personally to start off with his work. It's important to clarify, when I say distant, I mean when a filmmaker takes a step back from the film world. Often this is a technical aspect, like literally shooting a scene from a wide or long shot and actively avoiding to focus on anything particular within the frame. There are exceptions to this of course, like Park Hee Young's Camels, where long close-ups are used that often take their time focusing on specific details. The restrictive nature of these shots often leaves so much unseen it creates a more abstract sense of distance. Howe's distance is obviously more literal than this, and relies heavily on a scene's wider environment as a whole, and its lyrical contribution to the landscape of the mise-en-scene. He isn't the only filmmaker to adopt this distant method, of course. There's been many, many filmmakers that have done this as well, and still do it to this day. However, there's something very particular and idiosyncratic about how he does it, and also how it's evolved throughout his career. To understand this further, we need to have a basic idea of the evolution of Hao's body of work, which to us is broken down into three acts. These acts are also useful when considering where you want to start with his work. Act 1 The first stage of Hao's career revolved around his commercial rural rom-coms in the early 80s. These films showed talent and are interesting to watch if you're a hardcore fan, but the aesthetics and authorship you find in his later work is not quite there. This was up until he made The Boys from Feng Kui in 1983, when Hao was finally able to push the industry restraints of the time, and the moment he apparently had his cinematic epiphany. This was the stage when Hao began to consciously use his famous cinematic distance. Apparently he was struggling to write the script for The Boys from Feng Kui, and eventually figured it out after deciding to adopt an objective godlike perspective of the narrative, where the audience will be forced to observe the film with a sense of otherness. The reason Hao began to seek this more objective perspective of his characters was to try and see them clearly and without judgement, to add as much context as possible. Visually this meant moving the camera back from the close-up and medium shots that traditional film style demands. Hao said he was constantly repeating, pull back, pull back, to his cinematographer as they were shooting, which eventually led to the camera being further and further away from the subjects. He also began to allow the length of each shot to increase, limiting the editing as much as possible. Cutting within a scene often means directing the viewer's attention in such a way it imposes a point of view on the action. By allowing the events to play out in long takes, the viewer is left more freedom to determine their own responses and interpretations. Act 2 This was the period Howe's idiosyncratic themes and techniques began to take flight, 
his cinematography became more static and reserved, and his subject matters personal and social political. Often choosing to focus on rural settings, or at least giving the rural lifestyle a sense of contextual significance. Most of the films were either based on Hao's own adolescence, like A Time to Live, A Time to Die, or his writers Chu Chen Wen and Wu Nian Jian, like Summer at Grandpa's and Dust in the Wind. The second act can be broken down by two trilogies. The first is the Coming of Age trilogy, which is made up of nostalgic and very personal films about growing up in the rural areas of Taiwan. The second is the Taiwanese History Trilogy, which is made up of films that resulted in Hao becoming the megastar he is today, and as the title says, is about films relating to Taiwan's history, that at the time was never properly depicted. I'll go into more detail about Hao's trilogies later on in the video, but for now I want to focus on the changes he made regarding his cinematic methods in this era. It's important to point out that Hao's distance approach is not like Kubrick's, which was far colder and technically indulgent. Hao's distance is not as technically conscious as somebody like Kubrick. He often says his reasons for distant shots is about how he feels personally, and often struggles to articulate it logically in interviews. As counterintuitive and paradoxical as this sounds, the distance Hao creates is incredibly subjective, and creates a sense that you're almost overhearing a conversation. The fact it's so far away makes you want to lean in further and find out what's going on. This is why when you finish watching a film of his, you feel so much part of it. To those more familiar with his work, you'll know how influenced he has been by the work of Japanese filmmaker Yasujiro Ozu. There are many comparisons you can make, but there is one fundamental characteristic within Ozu's cinema that puts Hao's composition choices into perspective. Paul Schrader once used a correlation between Ozu's cinematic methods and the Zen art principle of Mu as a way of explaining the contextual and aesthetic stillness of his work. The character Mu simply means negative or emptiness, and in Zen art, emptiness is not necessarily viewed as the absence of something, but a character that's artistically present. Yes, this sounds confusing and contradictory, but it's actually quite simple, so bear with me. One painting Schrader refers to directly is Ma Yan's Lone Fisherman, which is an example of the one-corner style of composition. If you're even casually familiar with Zen art, you would most likely have noticed paintings that have only one corner of the canvas painted, leaving the rest untouched. The concept is based on the idea that before anything is painted, the canvas is something, i.e. A piece of canvas. Only when something is painted on it is the unpainted canvas truly empty. However, the emptiness is still very much part of the painting, and not just a lazy unpainted background. By placing a simple fishing boat in one corner of an empty composition gives meaning to the space as a whole. There's no need to paint water, as the clever use of compositional space has given us, as a spectator, the opportunity to create it ourselves. This could also explain why Hao's use of placing his subjects in the corners and sides of his frames works so well. Obviously how this concept is associated with his work is still quite nuanced, especially compared to the likes of Yoshida and Jisoji, whose compositional approach is more literal to the Mu principle, often creating a stark contrast between a character and actual empty space, even squeezing them into very small sections of the frame's outer composition. Hao doesn't literally use empty space as his canvas. His canvas is his location, the environment, and the often minor compositional presence of his characters gives it purpose, and vice versa. This is particularly prominent within the Puppet Master, where the characters are almost lost within the mise-en-scene of the compositions. You constantly see how both the characters are products of their environments, and the environments are product of the characters. Without each other, they have little to no meaning. Just like the lone fisherman, without the boat, there is no water, only a canvas. And without the empty canvas, there is also no water, only a boat. The distant long shots also give the actors time and space to become immersed within their character's situation, and bring new, more organic aspects to the scene. As Mike Lee famously once said, the whole thing about making films in an organic way on location is that it's not all about characters, relationships and themes. It's also about place, and the poetry of place. It's about the spirit of what you find, the accidents what you stumble across. 
Howe's middle to late films are some of the best examples of this ethos. Act 3 This is when Howe began to fuse into the second wave of Taiwanese cinema, almost like a veteran. The second wave is a whole video in itself, but to sum it up briefly, it was when the new Taiwanese filmmakers began to carry on where the first wavers took off, from the early 90s up until now. However, their subjects changed with Taiwan society, often dealing with the existential loneliness and isolation of urban life. At this point, house films evolved a more voyeuristic and otherness feel. They'd still use long takes, actually they became longer, but the camera was far more fluid, taking a step away from his Ozu West staticness, and became much more observational and mobile. Good Men Good Women's dual narrative was possibly the start of Howe's new urban focus narratives, which was a direction far from his earlier rural pictures. He also began to show an interest in observing the new youth generation, something a film like Millennium Mambo would emphasise more. Also, Howe began to show an interest in voyeuristically observing subjects that were a little further from his personal frame of reference, like modern Japanese culture in Café Lemire. Western domestics in Flight of the Red Balloon, and historical martial arts in The Assassin. Again, most of Howe's earlier personal films were set in rural backdrops, as it corresponded with his own upbringing. Yet most of his later, more voyeuristic films, though not all, were more urban-based. His subject matters were less personal, and observed things that were more foreign to him, which was actually a more natural evolution when you think about it that corresponded well with the distance and impartiality Howe was always trying to accomplish throughout his career. You could almost say that Howe's desire for aesthetic distance has taken his direction away from himself and pointed it to the unknown. Going back to the Zen principle of Mu, the further Howe went into his career, the more his narrative approach adopted this idea too. He would indulge more and more in the absence of character information and backstory relying heavily on suggestion and subtext. The little information he does give the audience is like the small painted corner of a Zen painting, where it is immersed within an ocean of empty space. The Assassin achieves a very similar effect as a martial arts film. There is only a small amount of actual martial arts shown in the film as a whole. The rest is simply emptiness. You could almost argue that Howe made the first genuine Zen martial arts picture. Okay, so let's finally get back to what this whole video is meant to be about. Where do we think you should start with his work? The best order we think is to start with his second act films, then his third act films, and then end with his first. If you can, start with The Boys from Fun Kuei, which because it's Howe's methodological and aesthetic transition film, it's a nice accessible way to ease yourself into his world of cinema. It actually works as a great appetizer for his coming of age trilogy, which is where we would recommend you go next, specifically A Time to Live, A Time to Die. Then it's probably best to move on to the Taiwanese history trilogy, Skip Daughter of the Na for now. This was a point where Howe was refining his distant still approach, whilst also dealing with more contextual and historically heavy subject matters. Going chronologically may help actually, from City of Sadness, then the puppet master, and ending with good men, good women. From here, you should have got a good enough idea of what you like about Howe to decide for yourself. You could go back to Daughter of the Nile, which is actually a very underrated film in my opinion, and start the female urban youth trilogy, which is made up of good men, good women, and Millennium Mambo. Or you can choose a more singular film, like Flowers of Shanghai, Goodbye South Goodbye, Café Lemire, Three Times, Flight of the Red Balloon, and the assassin, etc. If after these, you're like us, and completely in love with Howe's work, knock yourself out with the films from his first act, which despite not being on the same level of his later work, at least now you have a bit of a conceptual framework to appreciate them more than you would have otherwise. Anyway, we hope this list has been useful, if not we're sorry, we'll try and get a couple of list videos up soon about the Taiwanese new cinema and second wave, but until then, thanks for watching.